My name is Neha Narula, and I'm the research director of this small group at the MIT Media Lab called the Digital Currency Initiative. Um, and so, interesting story, I used to work on uh, databases, actually, and um, more recently, after, after finishing my PhD, I got really interested in cryptocurrencies. And so now people invite me to speak at their conferences thinking I'm going to talk about something useful like databases, and actually, I talk about cryptocurrencies instead. Um, so, but this talk is going to be about databases and cryptocurrencies. And you are probably thinking, what do these two things actually have to do with each other? Well, we're going we're gonna to go on a, on a journey to connect the two. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about here is this idea of interoperability. Uh, so how many people here take pictures, maybe with their phone? Yeah, pretty much everybody. Um, where do you put those pictures? So. My pictures are everywhere. They are on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Dropbox and my old phone and my new phone and my computer and an SD card somewhere, right? Um, it's a huge mess. It's a serious, serious mess. We have all of these apps and photos that are trying to capture our photos and uh, our apps and services that are trying to capture our photos and none of them actually work together. Uh, who remembers um, back when Instagram photos showed up in line in Twitter? Yeah, so, so I, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but um, in 2012, Instagram actually turned off support for showing photos in Twitter, right? And so now when someone links to, an, when someone shares their Instagram photo on Twitter, you just see a link and you have to click through and go to Instagram's website. So let's just be clear here. This is a photo that I took and I posted on Instagram. I have explicitly chosen to share it with Twitter. And it's probably public anyway, since most Instagram photos are public. And yet, because Instagram said so, Twitter's not allowed to show it in line, and you have to go through this extra link. So it really makes you wonder, whose photo is it? Whose data is it? This data really belongs to Instagram. It doesn't belong to me. And so we have all of these fake forms of interoperability everywhere. Uh, you know, your app probably comes with some kind of API so you can share to Facebook or share to Snapchat or whatever. But can you easily take the data that the app creates outside of the application? And can you do things with that app's data that maybe it doesn't want you to do or that its API wasn't designed for you to do? That is true interoperability. So I want to dig into another data nightmare um, that a lot of people have experienced. So have you guys seen shelves like these before? Uh, I don't know, you know, in the UK and America, everyone would be like, yes. So these are medical charts. Uh, and medical charts are incredibly important. They hold all of this really important data, like, you know, your weight, your blood pressure, what vaccines you've had, your medications, what you're allergic to, uh, your treatment. This is really, really important stuff. Um, and until very, very, very recently, these were kept up to date by hand. So my mother is a pediatrician, and she had shelves like these in her office. And at the end of the day, she would sit down and she would do her charts. So she would update her charts by hand. You know, this is really important information, and it's not backed up, it's not searchable, and it's really hard to share with other providers. Uh, so, you know, it's 2016 now, and things are a little bit different. We can go digital. You can put health records in a database. Um, and there's a name for this. It's called electronic medical records. It's a huge thing right now in healthcare. Uh, the Obama administration is even giving out incentives for doctors to switch over to electronic medical records. Um, but unfortunately, going digital doesn't fix all of our problems with health records. Uh, my provider stores my electronic medical records digitally. Every time I go get a checkup, um, you know, I get this update on a website that updates all my vitals and my stats and medications. But yet, when I go to a new doctor or a new provider, they're not on the same system, and I have to literally sit there and tell them everything about myself. You know, there's no way of porting that data over. I don't know if you guys have this problem in the UK because you have single-payer healthcare, but you know, you might experience the same thing if you move to a different country, for example. So the data, even though it's electronic, even though it's stored online, isn't transferable. 
And why is that? Well, when people build applications today, they build them kind of like this, and this is a drastically simplified picture. Usually, um, users interact with their data through an application. So, you know, the application, the company is running some code in the cloud, and it's implementing application logic that's reading and writing to a database. Uh, usually, the application and the database sit behind this kind of giant red line, the network security perimeter. And the network security perimeter is really important. Um, you know, this is for security purposes. We're trying to protect the data. We're trying to keep it safe. Totally fair. But unfortunately, this design has a lot of drawbacks. Sharing data can be really hard even within an organization uh, without giving others full access to your entire system. It's also really hard to, conduct, uh, to construct an audit trail. So when a problem happens, you can tell who had access to what and like what got you into the situation you're in right now. A database administrator with enough power can change data without being detected. But most importantly, this design discourages different applications from working together. It makes it really hard for applications across administrative domains to share data. So the user can do it manually, right? They can interact with each of the applications through their web interface. Um, you know, this is the equivalent of me having to tell every single doctor that I visit uh, my entire medication, my entire health history. Um, or, you know, they could write a web scraper to do this, which is horrible and brittle and manual. Maybe if we're really lucky, the applications have uh, poked well-defined holes in their security perimeter and set up APIs. Uh, and so this means, I mean, this is a little bit better, right? The applications are supporting APIs. We can, we can write programs to share data across them. But what's happening here is that there's still two different applications with two logical copies of the data in different schemas that were constructed after going through different application logic. And so if you really care about the data that's on both sides, for example, in healthcare or in the finance industry, then usually the applications have to do some kind of manual reconciling work, like settlement between banks, and um, to make sure things didn't go wrong. And I've seen lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, people send, send emails to each other with giant lists, uh, Excel spreadsheets traded back and forth. In the finance industry, they still use faxes sometimes. So we have a lot of problems with the way that things currently work, right? The back office reconciliation is slow and terrible and requires a lot of resources. Uh, you know, it's really hard to share data, and the worst part is that if you add another provider into the mix, then usually you have to do a new integration with everyone, so it's an n-squared problem. Uh, you have to fix up two logical data stores, and you know, the whole reason that we structured this thing, things this way for security to protect our data, it doesn't even work all the time. Like Sony was hacked, Target was hacked. Hacks happen all the time. So what can we do about this? Well, I think that part of the solution is changing around our data model. So instead of it looking like this, it looks like this. Applications construct the data together. We put the data and the validation first into the protocol, and using the abstraction of an append-only log combined with some pretty simple cryptography, we can, we can construct the data together across different administrative domains. And this makes it much easier to add a third application because you just need to, to kind of add them in and say, here's the data, here's the protocol, go. You can go implement it any way you want, but the data's right here. And with this kind of a system, a user could even control their data themselves. They could update their own data directly. So what I've just described is what we mean when we're talking about a blockchain. How many of you guys have heard about blockchains and blockchain technology? Okay, great. So um, it's, it's a, I think that the, the whole blockchain thing is actually a lot of really old ideas put together in a new way, with one exception, and I'll get to that exception soon. And part of what's going on here, the space has a tremendous amount of hype, is that people are really attracted to the idea of this global database in the sky that everyone runs together, but no single person actually owns. So the word blockchain is super amorphous, and if you ask 10 different people, you'll probably get 10 different definitions for what it means. Uh, it's also very overhyped, but 
I'm gonna give you my definition of what I think it means. So here are the important components of a blockchain and, um, and why people find it interesting and useful. Distributed consensus, public key cryptography, and common data formats and protocols. So first, let's talk about consensus. So the problem of distributed consensus is the problem of multiple computers uh, distributed across a network all getting together and agreeing on a single value. Now, if you run a consensus protocol many, many times and agree on many different values, then you can, con you can construct yourself an ordered log, which is a very useful primitive. Now, if instead of storing values in that log, you store operations, then you have an operation log, and you can use that to build state machine replication and a distributed database. So this primitive is really cool because it gives us the tools to build a distributed database. Now, distributed consensus, um, as most of you have probably heard of it, usually assumes a crash recover fault tolerance model. So nodes can fail, and as long as only a certain number of nodes fail, even if they crash and come back up again, um, then uh, we're gonna be okay. Our log is still gonna be correct. We're, we're all gonna agree on the same values and we're all gonna have the same state on each of our nodes. Now there are a lot of existing systems that do this. Paxos, Zookeeper, Raft. Um, it's incredibly useful and it's used across many different companies. Now, you might not have heard of this other fault tolerance model called Byzantine fault tolerance. So with Byzantine fault tolerance, things get a little trickier. No, it's not just that nodes can fail, they can become actively evil and do crazy things in your system. Now, the cool thing about this is even though you have nodes that are actively out to get you running in your system, in your protocol, as long as there's only a certain number of them, we have protocols that can still reach consensus and that can still construct this primitive, this log. Uh, you might have heard this formulated as the Byzantine generals problem, which is the idea of a lot of generals who all together want to attack a city. Um, and if they don't do it all together, then they'll fail, they won't take the city, but some of the generals might be turncoats. So they say they're gonna attack, but they're really not going to. Um, and there are protocols that can handle a small number of nodes being Byzantine and we can still have this log. And just to be clear, consensus is a really old field. So um, here's a timeline. It was first talked about in the late 70s and early 80s. I think um, 1982 is when Leslie Lamport and others uh, published this paper on the Byzantine generals problem. Uh, and now, and, and you know, then there was a lot of work on, um, on other fault tolerant consensus algorithms and even Byzantine fault tolerance rose to uh, prominence for a little while. Um, in 1999, this paper called Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance was published and then in the early 2000s, there were many, many different papers kind of improving on this protocol uh, and making it work better in the optimized case. And then after that, things kind of fell off for a while. Byzantine fault tolerance sort of fell out of favor mainly because no one in industry was really using it. People were using just regular old fault tolerant consensus protocols instead. And in 2006, Google published the Chubby paper. Um, and uh, in 2014, we have the RAF paper, which is very exciting. And in 2009, something kind of sneakily happened on the side, which is that Bitcoin, the, one of the first cryptocurrencies uh, was launched. So Byzantine fault tolerance kind of died out for a while, but cryptocurrencies are actually bringing it back, which is really interesting. So we have this log, right? We're running distributed consensus. We figured out how to build this log, and you know, we can even tolerate Byzantine actors. Um, but with cryptography, we can do even more than that, okay? So um, the important parts of cryptography that play a part in blockchains are asymmetric signatures and hash functions. And what, what they do is they allow us to move security to be within the data. So instead of having this network security perimeter surrounding your entire application, you've either encrypted the data or you've signed it so that it can't be modified. And so this is really helpful because we can use this for secrecy, we can use this to prove provenance, um, and users have a different form of identity than they did in the old system. Now they're using a public-private key pair, and this is something that's portable across applications. So, okay, we have a protected, encrypted, uh, signed log, great. Uh, but what we really want is interoperability, and that doesn't happen if people can't read each other's data formats. So 
uh, Bitcoin came along and had a format for the transfer of value. And you can go look, like the transaction format for Bitcoin is like very well specified and everyone has to use the same transaction format. And I think that when we put this agreement up front on a data format, when we're designing the validation protocol, so whether an operation in the log is well formed or not, then things like shared application logic become easier to deal with. And I want to be clear, this is not a trivial thing to do. This is standard setting. There are many, many bodies, the IETF, the W3C, that try to do this, and it seems like a long, drawn-out, frustrating process. I do not want to be involved in it. But for certain things, if we can do this ahead of time, if we can agree on a protocol um, and a validation process in a data format, then that can be a really powerful thing that people can build on. So when used across administrative domains, this combination, distributed consensus, public key cryptography, and common data formats, uh, this combination is really powerful. You end up with this totally auditable log, and you can redo validation if you want to, to ensure correctness, and you can ensure that things haven't been tampered with. So that's blockchain technology in, in, in a nutshell. This is what people are talking about, right? Um, it's cool, and it's useful, and it's very interesting, and it can solve some problems in the real world, but I wouldn't exactly call it innovative. Most of the things that I mentioned in there are at least 30 years old. So in order to talk about what I think is new, um, what I think is really powerful about this space, uh, let's talk about how you might build decentralized digital cash on top of this log, okay? So we're trying to build decentralized cash here. And um, we all kind of have digital cash right now. You know, we, we have credit cards, we have bank transfer, but all of that is done through an institution. Um, you know, it's, it's Visa that controls my credit card it's, and is, is deducting and adding things to my account. Uh, it's, it's my bank that controls my bank transfers. So we're talking about, you know, digital tokens, digital money that, that isn't controlled by an institution here. And the way that we're going to uh, represent that are by, you know, unique tokens. So Alice wants to pay Bob. Well, Alice is going to give Bob a unique token, and that unique token is going to represent one coin. So... There are a few potential problems with digital token transfer, okay? And we're gonna kinda talk about these problems a little bit and understand how cryptocurrencies solve them. So the first major problem is that uh, an attacker could intercept the transfer and steal the funds, right? It's just this digital token. Another is that an attacker could possibly, if they see your digital token, spend it without your permission. Uh, and then there are two other attacks called the replay attack and the double spend attack, which I'll go into more detail on in a minute. So we're constructing this decentralized digital currency, and the way that we're going to do it is by taking our log primitive and putting in entries that stand for transfers. So this might be an entry in the log. Alice is going to pay Bob one coin, and this is the coin that she's going to pay him. Uh, let's ignore where the coins come from for now. Assume that people have some. Uh, so a problem here is, well, what if Eve steps in and is listening on the network and manages to get a hold of this coin before Bob does? How are we going to handle this problem? Well, Alice has a solution to this. She can um, use public key cryptography. So Bob has a public key, and Alice, if Alice knows what it is, then she can uh, encrypt the message in such a way that only Bob knows how to open it. So Eve is out of luck here. Uh, you know, she can't... She can't actually have access to this because it's locked for Bob. Okay, so asymmetric cryptography helps us with this first problem. Uh, well, what if Eve you know, knows the name, knows the tags of some coins ahead of time? How is she going to, you know, what if she uh, spends a coin before Alice can? Well, Alice also has a public-private key pair, and what Alice can do is Alice can use her private key, and she can sign the transaction saying, I, Alice, am sending this to Bob. And it comes with a signature. And if everyone knows that this belongs to Alice because they've been looking at the log up in the past and they saw that Alice received this coin, then you know, they can wait until they see a transaction with a valid signature before approving it and adding it to the log and spending it. OK, great. So signatures help us with that other problem. And, and please note, all bets are off if people end up losing their private keys. So we need something else to help with that. So the replay attack. So let's say 
uh, Bob is the evil one in this situation, and he would like two coins. So what's to stop him from simply creating uh, a copy of this thing? And, and, and here we're really lying, relying on the fact that all the coins are unique and we have this ordered log. Because all the coins are unique and we have this ordered log, we'll never allow in the same coin to be spent twice. Uh, so there's another problem. Alice could be evil and Alice could try to spend the same coin twice. Uh, she, by, by kind of tricking uh, Bob and Carol, Alice could say, okay, I'm gonna give this coin to you, Bob. Here's this transaction saying I'm giving it to you. Here's another transaction, Carol, spending the same coin. And kind of what I was alluding to earlier, both of these problems, the replay attack and the double spend problem, are solved because we have this primitive of this log. And because all of the actors in the system are watching the log and making sure and not accepting uh, uh, coins that are spent twice. So digital cash was attempted many times in the past, um, the most well-known attempt being Chaumian eCash. And in the past, it always relied on a trusted intermediary. And sometimes the amount of trust you placed in this inter intermediary varied. Sometimes um, the bank couldn't really see what you were doing, sometimes they could see everything, sometimes they could stop you from spending a coin, sometimes they couldn't. Um, but, and, and a lot of people tried to start companies around this idea of digital eCash and all of these companies failed. All of these, uh, you know, they all went out of business and we didn't have um, digital e-cash that wasn't controlled by an institution. It wasn't until Bitcoin that this actually worked and became something useful in practice. And I would argue Bitcoin is useful in practice. It's worth about $10 billion right now and people are doing a lot of exchanges on the system. It's incredibly helpful if you wanna do um, cross-border currency exchanges. It can help you avoid a lot of fees. I know people who do this. Um, and so why is, why is this working now? Well, I think what the main difference is, is that Bitcoin is totally decentralized. There's no central point of control, there's no CEO, there's, there's no single server that is running the system. And instead of requiring the users to trust intermediaries, um, it allows users to verify correctness for themselves. So, okay. Uh, you know, let me show you a little bit of, you know, what this, this log actually looks like. So um, this is the data structure that this log, that the log in most blockchains looks like. Uh, you know, instead of running distributed consensus to agree on every single transaction, we're gonna batch them together and we're gonna agree on a block of transactions and here's some of the, here's some of the fields of the block. Um, and I, I wanna talk about um, this thing called the Merkle root in a minute. Um, but what's important here is that each block contains inside of it a hash of the previous block in the chain. Um, and the next block will have a hash of this block. And that kind of serves to, um, to link all of these blocks together. So if I wanted to go back and change something in this white block over here, it would change the hash. And this would no longer match up and, that, and, and, and this would no longer match up either. And so you, know, you can't go back in time and change things without breaking um, the, the hash links. And so, so, uh, so let's talk about um, now how else we're using hashes to help with transactions. So um, Bitcoin and a lot of other cryptocurrencies use this data structure called a Merkle tree to store transactions. And you might be wondering why, like what's the point of putting the transactions into something more complicated than a simple list or array. Well, first let's talk a little bit about how a Merkle tree works. So the way that a Merkle tree works is that um, you take all the things that you wanna put in the tree uh, and you hash them. And then you hash the hashes. And then you hash the hashes again. And you keep doing this. You keep kind of hashing everything that's under you until you get to the top and then the top hash, which note is just the size of one hash, so it's independent of the size of your entire data set, is called the Merkle root. But because you've used all of the data to compute this hash, it kind of in some ways represents all of the data in your data set. You can't change one entry without changing the hash. And what this does is it allows people to ask the question uh, very quickly and efficiently of, is this piece of data in my data set? and users use this to tell whether or not their transaction has been incorporated into a block. So if I'm a user and I wanna know if my transaction C has made it into this block, I only need to ask the server for two pieces of information, the things in yellow. And with the things in yellow, I, I, can, I can then construct 
uh, my own path and make sure that it matches the Merkle root that I, that's, that's in the block. And so this is how I confirm that my transaction is in a block without downloading the whole block and checking for myself. But, so, so that's great, and we have kind of these cute ways of you know, using hashing to link all these blocks together and to link all of these transactions into a block. Um, but you know, how do we actually make this log in the first place in a decentralized cryptocurrency? So currency is a pretty valuable thing. Probably there are a lot of people who would like to steal money from you. Um, so we're probably going to want to at least use a BFT algorithm. We can't assume that, um, that people in, in this protocol are honest. But, you know, it's not as simple as just taking an existing Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm because existing Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms all require the participants to be known ahead of time. So that means you need someone blessing the participants or assigning IDs or creating a list of, of trusted keys that are in the, in this, in the community. Um, and we're operating in a trustless environment. We don't want to place trust in one person to control admissions into the environment. Um, but if there's no one controlling admissions, if it's just an open system and anyone can join, then an attacker could just flood the system with fake identities. And this is what's known as a Sybil attack. And so this is a problem with systems that require identity. You need someone assigning identity to the nodes, otherwise an attacker could just create a million fake nodes with different identities and screw up your voting process. And, and this is what I think was the innovation, okay? This is what makes all of this blockchain stuff different than what happened 30 years ago uh, in computer science research. Um, so this guy, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, and, and we have no idea who Satoshi Nakamoto is, so he is to this day unknown. Uh, he's the one who kind of just came on the internet and dropped the Bitcoin code and the Bitcoin paper on everyone and was like, here's the system, I'm running it, I, I created the first block, I've embedded the words, um, you know, Chancellor on the, brink, uh, on the brink of bailing out the banks. So this was uh, in 2008, 2009 when, um, you know, the economy was kind of in trouble. Uh, he just dropped this code and this system on people and, said, and stuck around for a little while but didn't actually stick around that long. And you know, his paper kind of described this new digital decentralized cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. And what was very interesting about it was that there wasn't anyone controlling access to the system. There was no central trusted bank and there was, you didn't know, need to know the set of participants ahead of time. Instead, participants could just come from wherever and join the system, and they, but they had to do this thing called proof of work. And his new sort of form of consensus is often called Nakamoto consensus in the literature. Um, okay, so the way that proof of work is used to gate access to the system is as follows. Uh, so we're gonna add a couple of things to the block. We're gonna add these new things in yellow. One of them is a difficulty level and the other is this thing called a nonce. So what's happening here is that in order to produce a block in this system, you have to show that you solved a puzzle. And this puzzle is not something you can pre-compute ahead of time, and it's not something that you can just, you know, buy the answer to. You literally have to sit there and, um, and spin your cycles and expend CPU power and expend energy. Energy actually turned out to be the thing that was sort of the most expensive about all of this, um, calculating the answer to this puzzle, which is basically trying to find the pre-image of a hash. And once you have found the answer to this puzzle, then you include it in a block, and that's what makes your block valid. So in order to get right access to the system, in order to participate in the protocol and put your block up as, with transactions as a candidate, you have to spend a bunch of money and waste a bunch of energy in CPU cycles. And this is how we get around the Sybil attack. Because, sure, you can Sybil attack the system if you want, but then, you know, you can't just create identities for free. You're going to have to go out there and figure out how to generate all of that CPU power because an identity in this system is really evidence that you have expended energy and money producing uh, this nonce, uh, which is the answer to a puzzle. And it's because of this design um, and again, the pieces of this design were there before Satoshi Nakamoto put them together. There was a form of digital cache called Hashcash, but he was the one who kind of pasted all of these things together. Because of this design, we have this. So this is a data center, probably in China, 
which is a rack of ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits. So basically, the puzzle that Satoshi chose, it turns out that you can optimize that puzzle in hardware, uh, which people did because Bitcoin started to become worth something. And so they wanted to be able to solve the puzzle faster than everybody else because that's actually how you get new Bitcoin. Um, so there's all this special hardware for computing the answer to that puzzle really, really fast. This hardware is completely useless for anything else. The only thing it's good for is for um, generating uh, blocks and Bitcoin. And uh, supposedly people say the Bitcoin network is using on the order of the same amount of energy as Ireland. So there's a paper out there which says that, you know, the energy that the entire country of Ireland expends, that's the amount of energy that the Bitcoin network is expending uh, every day working on uh, solving this puzzle and computing the blocks. Uh, just peer review in this area is still a little spotty, so it's unclear if this answer is totally correct, but you know, people have tried to figure it out. So big question here, why bother? Why do people bother solving this puzzle? Why do people follow the rules? Uh, you know, this is a very shady industry, right? Uh, Bitcoin was a currency of Silk Road. Uh, it's often used for ransomware. It's, it's, uh, you know, its origins were not exactly the best. And so, it, you know, it came out of a, a very mysterious community. And, and you got to kind of wonder, why is it even still here? Um, you know, why hasn't it been hacked? And I think part of that reason is because Satoshi designed a really clever game. So the reason that people follow the rules is because it's in their best rational interest to follow the rules. They make money by following the rules. So remember those three things before that are part of blockchains, distributed consensus, public key cryptography, common data formats and protocol? Well, let's add one more really interesting piece to this puzzle, mechanism design. So mechanism design is this part of game theory. And in mechanism design, you have some goal or outcome that you want to have happen. And you design a game so that if, if the participants act rationally, you design a game with an incentive structure so that if the participants act rationally, you end up with your outcome. So this is often used in um, advertising auctions. Uh, it's an attempt to try to get people to bid their true value for what they actually value the auction for. Um, so, this is, was a really, really clever, Bitcoin was a really clever application of mechanism design. Um, and Bitcoin's security relies on this game. Uh, and it relies on assumptions about rationality. Uh, so Satoshi Nakamoto tried to construct a game where this is how rational participants would behave. They would try to solve the puzzle for Bitcoins. Um, and they would always build on the longest valid chain. And the longest valid chain would be the one that the other rational ones are all uh, building upon. Um, and, you know, so longest means that the majority of the network is behind this chain. Valid means that we're following the rules of the protocol. And because of this incentive system, you can go off and try to create your own chain, your own blocks, your own ledger accounting system, but you really have to ask yourself, are other people gonna follow it? Because if they're not, then your money's gonna be worthless because no one's actually operating on that chain of yours that you made. Um, now, a big assumption underlying the security of the system is that Bitcoins are actually worth something. Uh, why should you believe that Bitcoins are worth something? Bitcoins are literally bits that, that are non-existent and are manufactured out of nowhere by a computer program that an anonymous person dropped on the internet in 2008. Well, that's a whole nother talk, and I think that that's about money and economic value and why we value the things that we do. But the point is, if I had a Bitcoin today, I could exchange it for, I'm not even sure how much right now, over 600 US dollars. And uh, I think everyone agrees US dollars are valuable. So because of this, we can apply game theory and we have some confidence in the security of the system. And so, you know, but where before we had that BFT model of some of the actors are malicious, some of them are very faithful and are following the protocol, now we have this other model where everyone's a little bit mysterious. We don't even know who everyone is. We don't know who the participants in the system are. We don't know how many of them there are. Um, we're just assuming that they're rational and that most of them won't collude. Um, and this seems to work in practice. And uh, as long as this is the case, then 
you know, all of these uh, non-colluding actors will construct the longest chain. And even if some of the actors decide to collude and to try to make a different chain, maybe to double spend the same coin, um, they're not gonna have the longest chain. And so everyone's gonna ignore their fork and they're gonna follow uh, the longest chain. Now, Bitcoin has a lot of downsides. Um, the biggest one, the one that gets talked about the most, is energy usage for proof of work. And it, and it is very high and it's very troublesome. Um, and a, that's why a lot of people are looking into different types of open admissions consensus algorithms to try to solve this problem. Another problem is performance. Literally every node on the Bitcoin network is storing an entire copy of the blockchain and has to validate uh, every single transaction. So uh, this, is, you know, this is a very slow system. Uh, concentration of mining power. So a big assumption uh, regarding security is that actors don't collude. But what we're actually seeing happening here is that um, mining has become a very profitable business in places where energy is very cheap. And so people build these giant data centers and that means a lot of hash power is under the control of a few individuals. Another major problem with Bitcoin is difficulty of use. It is very hard to use. I actually really dislike having to buy things with Bitcoin because it's very annoying. You have to dig out your, your public keys, you have to figure out you know, which wallet you wanna use, um, scan a QR code. Uh, but speaking of which, I have like thousands of dollars of Bitcoin on the Bitcoin testnet, so fake Bitcoin, and if anyone wants one, I'm happy to show you how to set up a wallet and I'll give you like $100 of fake Bitcoin and you can try it out. <laughs> Um, and then another major problem is this uncertainty of a new currency. So the currency and the fact that the system has economic value is, is incredibly important for maintaining security in this open admission system. But a lot of people want to use this to do things that don't have anything to do with currency. So, um, you know, with, with good reason. They, maybe they don't want to undermine the US dollar or the euro or the pound. And so um, how are they going to secure their system? But I think we can learn a lot from Bitcoin, and, and there's a lot here that I find really interesting. So first of all, an open admissions, rationality-based consensus protocol can work at scale. That is really cool. We've never seen that happening before Bitcoin. Second, simple transaction formats are really useful, and they enable all of this innovation. You can build all of these different types of applications on top of them. And then third, giving users the power to audit their own transactions is also powerful. Users don't have to trust intermediaries or third parties. They can actually validate things for themselves. And note that they don't have to validate things for themselves. If they want to trust a third party to do that, that's totally okay. But in this system, they have the option. And what this means is that we get more open systems with less trust, and we end up having more choice and more interoperability. Now, I alluded to the fact that a lot of people want to use uh, blockchains for things that have non-currency applications, and, and here's just some of them. And this is what really got me interested in this area, was talking to people, um, especially people who work in the developing world and are trying to do things like bank the unbanked um, or provide more financial inclusion. And they were really excited about this technology because they thought that it had the potential to help them solve their very real problems. Now, I want to talk about just, you know, one of those problems really quickly in my last few minutes. Um, there are so many inefficiencies in our existing financial system, and one of the worst ways that this manifests itself is in how expensive it is to be poor. Oftentimes, the poor don't have access to financial services, or when they do, they get hit with the highest fees and the highest interest rates. And Quite simply, our current financial system is not serving everyone, and we see that in many different areas. There are a lot of people who don't have access to credit because they don't have a traditional credit history. So in the eyes of lenders and the banks, they just don't exist. Rampant fraud reduces access to capital for many small businesses. In some areas, contracts are totally unenforceable, and oftentimes rural communities are without access to basic infrastructure because they can't get the investment they need to build it. So things are like this because right now, today, everything we do with money is mediated by the banks. They set the terms and our choices are limited. Now, I wanna think about a different world for money um, and I wanna think about that by looking at the internet. So the power of the internet is that it's this peer-to-peer -peer system with open protocols. Anyone can stand up a server, anyone can join the network. 
Um, and a lot of really amazing applications and protocols have evolved on top of this. We have uh, email and video conferencing and chat and social networking and e-commerce and mobile platforms. In the blockchain space, we want to do for value what the internet did for information. So, um, you know, the blockchain can be used to keep track of transactions in a secure and verifiable way. And we're, we're starting to see, we're at the beginning, we're at the cusp of some really interesting things developing in this space. Uh, but we're still definitely at the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of people in, in my industry are a little, bit, uh, a little bit down on Bitcoin and blockchain because they don't think that you know, we've seen world-changing applications come out of them yet. But I think that's because um, if, if you compare this space to the internet, we're in what was the 80s of the internet right now in the Bitcoin blockchain space. We're still trying to get the protocols baked. We're still trying to figure things out. Um, and uh, you know, this is gonna take a little bit more time. I now, I want to point out that a lot of large companies are investing in blockchain technology. It's a very, like I said, it's a very overhyped space. Um, but what I described to you in this picture right here, this is not what the banks are building. Um, blockchains can mean many different things. Uh, and a lot of the consortia in this space are just rebuilding the existing financial infrastructure under some new buzzwords. And I think they're missing the point because the power of what's happening here is that it's open. All right, uh, thank you very much. Here's the website for my group at MIT and also a talk I did on the future of money, which kind of helps hopefully describe a little bit about why things like Bitcoin are worth anything. Um, and thank you for listening. Do we have a couple questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have time for a couple questions. I just want to ask about that. Um, so do you think Bitcoin will take over real money or perceived real money as we see it today or something else will take over later? Yeah, that's a really good question. The question was, will Bitcoin take over real money? And a lot of people ask this, right? Um, and I have no idea. I, I mean, I think the Bitcoin system has a lot of serious flaws. Whether they'll be fixed within Bitcoin or fixed in a new cryptocurrency is a question. Um, I also think that uh, it's possible central banks will issue digital currency directly. Um, so, you know, the central banks are kind of dancing around this a little bit. Uh, you know, they're sort of, the, the, the way that money is issued uh, in the world today is that, um, you know, central banks change the interest rates uh, and commercial banks sort of hold central bank money. What if people could just hold central bank money themselves? Like, why not, right? And uh, central banks, you know, you could issue the dollar, a digital dollar, a digital pound, a digital euro. And I think if they do that in the right way, then there might not be as much of a need for cryptocurrencies. I don't know how likely it is that they'll do that in the right way, though. There's still a lot to learn. Um, you've started from saying about uh, potential of using blockchain for storing personal information like medical records, um, other stuff. Uh, but you've also mentioned that blockchain has inherent problems with uh, big energy consumption and uh, overhead because you need to transfer the whole blockchain. Do you think, that, or do you know many about some solutions which could overcome those problems to, for applications like medical records? Yeah, so um, I think what you were, sorry, it was a little bit hard to hear. One of the problems is, a, you know, how do you overcome problems like energy consumption and uh, everything being public? Is that, is that correct? Um, so, so the first set of blockchain stuff I talked about, that did not use any energy consumption. That was just running, I mean, any more than any computer program would use. So you only really incur the energy consumption costs when you're using proof of work, and you only need proof of work if you're operating in a system where you don't know who you are running the protocol with. So I think for things like medical records, you probably get a consortium of hospitals together, and they would run you know, a distributed consensus protocol, hopefully, and you, know, you would not need proof of work because you'd have identity. Now, when it comes to the problem of everything being public, I think we're making really exciting strides in that. So uh, last week, um, the first anonymous cryptocurrency was released, Zcash, um, and they use a primitive called zero-knowledge proofs, which are very exciting. And so basically, you can validate that um, you know, your coins exist and they haven't been double spent without having any idea about, you know, any third party having any idea about the amounts or who the transaction is between. 
So I think that there's going to be a lot of really exciting stuff as we apply sort of these areas of cryptography to blockchains. Okay, we're out of time, so uh, let's thank the speaker again.